Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone. Today we are going to talk about language acquisition. So, as we know, language is the uh, language is a remarkable endowment to human being, and perhaps language is one of the most important criteria which keeps us above all the rest of the species in the animal kingdom. But how language comes to us? how do we acquire language and uh, how it grows in us how we have we have never never noticed we don't even think of these things because it comes to us so naturally that we hardly notice language grows in us like nails and hairs we don't notice the growth of na our nails or the hair so you know it it happens so gradually and so consistently that we hardly notice any change so how it happens to us and how language comes to us this is exactly what we are going to talk about today so while talking about acquisition of language we have two three remarkable theoretical positions out of which behaviorist theory of first language acquisition or language learning or we can say learning has a very wider implication and uh, you know a long held tradition but this this thing changed in 1957 that's a remarkable era in the history of language and understanding of language as a phenomena so we'll talk about behaviorist paradigm in language learning today look at the human child and uh, if you happen to see child around a nascent newly born baby uh you know you have you must have noticed how they babble they coo they cry and how they are able to make sense of these babble coos and cries by sending and receiving messages both vocally and non vocally and from there we start as a baby and by the end of the first year a child starts imitating words and certain speech sounds right and perhaps at the end of the year from birth <coughs> the child utters a few words learns a few words very simple words few words by the age of 18 months one and a half year you see the vocabulary grows in terms of size of the word and also sometimes clustering these two three words together utterances and that speech sample is also known as telegraphic messages so by the age of 18 a child is able to uh you know sustain two to three words in a row and which forms an utterance so keywords the child starts using keywords uh by the end of three years of his age or her age child comprehends an incredible amount of speech in the environment and they start chattering non stop and uh, by the time child goes to school they start internalizing increasingly complex structures and their vocabulary is expanded and uh, they have certain communication strategies they develop certain communication strategies they know turn taking they know turn giving and this is how they start interacting frequently freely and flawlessly <coughs> 
and uh, they learn many, many functions of language by the time they go to school. So this is a remarkable development. And this development has been accounted by different theoreticians and practitioners in the field with different explanations. One of them is the behaviorist paradigm and how they account for this development in the child in terms of language. We are going to talk about that today. Now, you need to understand that behaviorist tradition is a long tradition of almost like John Locke's idea of Tabula Rasa in 17th century to 20th century, right? By the time B.F. Skinner comes up with his, his verbal behavior theory, it's a long tradition. So, there are certain verticals and pillars of this behaviorist paradigm we need to understand. Number one, tabula rasa, the idea, the concept of tabula rasa. This is one. The another vertical that we find in behaviorist paradigm is stimulus response. Right? The great Pavlov, right, in 1927 conducted the experiment and which you know happened to famous to be famous as uh, you know classical conditioning. So, the stimulus and response, that is another vertical in the behaviorist paradigm. Then Skinner introduced in 1938 the idea of operant conditioning, which he mentions in his 1957 work as well. And perhaps this operant conditioning becomes the, the basis of his verbal behavior theory. So, third you know, uh, vertical in behaviorist paradigm is operant conditioning. And then when you look at the consequent explanations of these three verticals, then you have reinforcement, then you have habit formation, and the, now it becomes part of human, total human behavior, right. So, tabula rasa, which roughly translates as clean slate in English, it is a Latin phrase which roughly translates as clean slate. And the modern idea of the theory is attributed to John Locke's mention of the idea in his essay concerning human understanding in 17th century. In Locke's philosophy, tabula rasa refers to the state that at birth the human mind is a blank slate without rules for processing data and that data is added and the rules for processing are formed solely by one's sensory experiences. So, this is what in 17th century John Locke mentioned and this idea was also used in the 20th century explanation of you know acquisition of language. Then stimulus response chain. Behaviorists believe that every stimulus will have a consequent response and every response has a corresponding stimulus. It is a chain, it goes on. And uh, this idea originated long back but became famous in terms of conditional, so classical conditioning given by Pavlov in 1927. And he conducted one of the most famous psychological experiments when he showed that by pairing a conditioned stimulus, a bell, with an unconditioned stimulus food, a dog would begin to salivate when the bell was rung without presenting the food. This became no, to be known as classical conditioning or stimulus response theory of behavior. Then the third vertical that we talked about is operant conditioning. Right. Operant conditioning is the use of consequences to modify the occurrence and forms of behavior. It refers to conditioning in which the organism, in this case a human being, produces a response or operant, a sentence or utterance without necessarily observable stimuli. This operant is maintained or learned by reinforcement, positive verbal response or positive Nonverbal response from another person. If a child says want milk and a parent gives the child some milk, 
the operant is reinforced and over repeated instances it is conditioned so child knows that you know i have to ask for milk and i'll get milk bf skinness reinforcement comes this operant conditioning and the idea of reinforcement comes out of his behavior behavior of organisms work produced in 1938 so he talks about two kinds of reinforcement right positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement so positive reinforcement results in lasting behavioral modifications which is long term and it stays with us negative reinforcement which is which is punishment changes behavior only temporarily and it's a short term gain it doesn't stay with us and it has many detrimental side effects then the process and the consequence of this this three verticals in behaviorist theory leads to habit formation so this is how hab habits are formed with positive reinforcement periodical reinforcement such behaviors are formed and this verbal behavior becomes part of the total human behavior this is how behaviorists respond to the question that how a human child acquires language now the whole idea of verbal behavior you know published in 1957 by bf skinner rests on the fact that human child is born with tabla rasa and whatever child learns a child learns in the environment so environment so it's so the learning of the child is environment dependent the child must have an appropriate environment to acquire language and how does child acquire language in terms of stimulus and response input that the child gets from the environment then frequent and and you know consistent reinforcement reward and punishment method where if the child utters right word he or she is appreciated if the child makes an mistake or commits an error then this is the child is subjected to pattern practices so that is punishment for the child and that child is conditioned in such a way that next time child gives you desired responses so this is stimulus and response chain and uh, this leads to operant conditioning right this operant conditioning leads to habit formation and once this series of responses become part of your habit you have developed verbal behavior and which is considered part of total human behavior so so language as a verbal behavior is part of total human behavior so the way we acquire other behaviors right we also acquire language in a similar way so this is an externally perceptible publicly observable thing this which is this is what behaviorist believed so according to skinner verbal behavior like other behaviors is controlled by its consequences so when consequences are rewarding we are talking about positive you know, reinforcement behavior is maintained and is increased in uh, strength and perhaps frequency when consequences are punishing or you know discouraging when there is a total lack of reinforcement the behavior is weakened and eventually extinguished so that this refers to frequent corrections that the parents or the people around the child make that's you no know? So Skinner's theories attracted a number of critics like Noam Chomsky but it also had people who defended it so if you look at this entire behavioral understanding of language acquisition it rests on three verticals number 1 stimulus response chain number 2 the idea of tabula rasa that's the basic philosophy of behaviorist paradigm where they talk about a child's you know uh, mental state being like a blank slate so there is no understanding there is no rule there is no data there is no knowledge of language at all it's a blank slate and child is dependent on the environment 
to learn language. So you have to keep in mind that language is something observable, perceptible, and externally demonstrated, you know, visible. So the data, the primary data comes to child as an input from the environment and then child responds to this stimulus. And this stimulus and response chain, right, leads to operant conditioning. Operant conditioning refers to reinforcements that we that, that we give to the child, positive or negative. So reward and punishment method where we we appreciate the child if the child utter, utters a right word or desired word and we correct or make corrections to the utterance of the child if the child commits an error and then child is subjected to pattern drill practices. So lots of practices are given to the child and then what Skinner says that when consequences are punishing or when there is a lack of total lack of reinforcement then but that means you don't appreciate you don't encourage the child to commit errors the behavior is weakened and eventually extinguished right so so that mistake goes away and the child learns the right response to any given stimulus and this is how behaviorists believe that we learn language now this is a remarkable thing to notice that behaviorists believed child to be born with a tabula rasa which was challenged later on by chomsky Right? But this whole idea of tabula rasa, you know, makes the child dependent on the environment in learning a language. Number two, learning a language is being equated with learning of any other human behaviors that we learn from the environment. Number three, language learning is not an autonomous phenomena in this behaviorist paradigm. But it is relegated to the environment depend dependency. So the child is dependent on the environment to learn the language, right? And uh, if you if you, if you try to deduct what we learn out of this behaviorist paradigm, we can summarize the whole idea, such as children are born with a tabula rasa, a clean slate, bearing no preconceived notion about the world or about language. So, child has no agency in learning. Then these children are shaped by environment and slowly conditioned through various schedules of reinforcement. Right? So, the environment, so if you go by this idea of blank slate, then the environment writes on it. So, the child gets everything from the environment and the, the reinforcement Periodical reinforcement, schedules of consistent reinforcement ensures that the child learns and learns in an appropriate way. Then third deduction we can make is that language is a fundamental part of total human behavior. So language is also considered here in this paradigm as other behaviors, like other behaviors. It's a part of total human behavior, language is one. So language is not being seen as an independent phenomena in this, in, this, in this paradigm. Then this behaviorist approach focuses on language in terms of externally perceptible aspects of linguistic behavior. So, 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 so no internal factor is being attributed in this entire learning process. So the child acquires a stimulus or input from outside and child response. So, the, so both input and output, linguistic input and linguistic output and the whole idea of processing are externally perceptible and observable, right. Then number five, a behaviorist considers effective language behavior as the production of correct responses to any given stimuli. That means they solely depend on a stimulus response gene, right? So child responds and learns what child gets from the environment. So child has no agency in learning, no independent agency, creativity and imagination in learning. Number six, if a particular response is reinforced, 
then it becomes part of habit and the individual is conditioned for the same. So given a consistent reinforcement about something, it becomes permanent in our habit, in our behavior, and we acquire it, we learn it. And uh, you know, any given stimuli, we are able to respond to it. This is what they believed. So the behaviorist view imitation and practice as primary process in language development. So imitations, that means they get from the environment, they imitate word for word repetition or of all part or someone else utterances and practice refers to repetitive manipulation of all these linguistic forms that the child is subjected to. So children's imitation is selective and based on what they currently are learning. So these are some deductions that we can make out of the behaviorist paradigm. And B.F. Skinner in 1957 published his work called Verbal Behavior. And perhaps that's the most significant monumental work in behaviorist paradigm for explaining language acquisition process or learning process. And he builds on the already existing explanations like classical conditioning, like stimulus response chain, like tabula rasa, idea of tabula rasa. So he builds on all these existing, uh, you know, part of system of knowledge about language in behaviorist paradigm and he summarizes in his work called Verbal Behavior published in 1957, which drew a lot of attention in academia as well as in the by the practitioners, right? But it also invited a lot of criticism. The whole idea of operant conditioning was questioned in terms of language, not in other behaviors, not in other cognitive skills, but as far as language is concerned, this whole idea of behavior, language as a behavior was questioned. And the leading attack was done by Noam Chomsky, right? Because this behaviorist theory leaves no space for the child to be creative, to be imaginative, and gives no agency to the child in learning. Right? So this idea of reinforcement, this idea of operant conditioning, habit formation, it looks very fine and, and convincing. And people have done researches to establish these ideas. But there are certain puzzling questions that leaves us unanswered when we solely depend on behaviorist theory of language acquisition and learning. So despite all the merits that behaviorist theory or paradigm has, uh, there are certain puzzling questions. Questions like, does it really explain the language acquisition phenomenon and its complexities? Do we really believe that the sim simplistic view that the uh, you know, behaviorist put forward in their explanation can hold or account for the complexity of learning a language? Uh, can language be equated with other human behaviors? Can language be considered as a behavior in the first place? Number two. Can we equate learning of language with the learning of other human behaviors? Right? What happens to the agency of the child in this process of learning? The child has any agency in learning or is it completely dependent on the environment? Does it undermine and underline child's autonomy and creativity? Right? Now the question is that if all the children in a particular environment get the same input, why do we have varied linguistic outputs? Why do we have so much variation in learning? Right. Number next 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 you know, question that that we can raise in behaviorist theory is that does a child get the ideal and positive input only from the environment? 
So is it the case that child is presented with only positive data in the environment? Or do we create a special environment for a child to learn language? Or does the child learn a language in an ordinary normal environment? And the list continues. So Chomsky has criticized and he reviewed uh, Skinner's work, seriously criticized his work published in 1959, two years afterwards. And in 1957, the same year, when this verbal behavior theory was presented, published, Chomsky also published his you know, genetic paradigm, genetic theory. And uh, this debate began. It became very, uh, you know, rich by, you know, producing counter arguments for this behaviorist understanding of learning by Chomsky, and also giving, uh, you know, making foundation for genetic theory. So the psychological foundation is replaced by biological foundation of language. Chomsky brings it in a different perspective called genetic theory. We'll talk about this genetic theory and uh, innateness hypothesis in our next video. So, thank you very much.